everyone, so today's topic I'm actually going to talk about or kind of explain one that a lot of people seem to well struggle with and maybe find it a little bit more difficult because it is maybe a little bit like learning a different language but I think you'll find that English is can be a lot more complicated. So I'm going to talk about scientific names, also known as Latin names but I would argue that it's probably best not to really call them um, Latin names because a lot of them, while they're Latinized, I'll explain later, they're not actually all using Latin origin. So I'm just going to place my excess pens there and I'm just going to go over some of the major uh, topics in more like evolution taxonomy that you kind of need to know to know about scientific names. So scientific names are sort of organised by the ICZN so that is the International Commission for Zoological Nomenclature. So that is an organisation that kind of governs how scientific names, um, how species are named scientifically um, and, uh, well, officially, I guess it would be. So that's kind of where a lot of the rules come from. The botanists and fungi, the, is it? No. Well, whoever studies fungi, they have a different organisation. This is for zoological. Zoological means animals. For this video, I'm going to use an example just to make it a little bit easier to kind of work your way around rather than talk about random taxa too much. So I'm going to talk about Baron Sistrus sandellus. Um. So that's the scientific name and I'll talk more about the scientific name especially a bit later. So if we're working our way back we actually have to before we even really look at this scientific name maybe think about what categories of life it fits into and this is where you kind of can draw maybe some similarities with other groups of organisms. So, so the largest that I'm going to go into or sort of well, the widest covering I'm going to go into is a kingdom. So the most famous one that people might know, and this is the one that Baron Sistrus Santhelus falls into, and that's the animal kingdom. This is generally known as Animalia. So there's, there's so many misconceptions about what makes an animal. Um, and a lot of people kind of place different things into this category when it does have a set group of taxa species that are involved in it. So it does include stuff like worms, Corals, mammals, uh, birds, snails. So it includes a lot of things that a lot of people don't associate with being, say that, um, well, what they think is an animal. Je quite a few people will say it will only include mammals or vertebrates, but no, it does have loads of other taxa are really included in it. The earliest or most basal when I studied it was largely told to be the sea squirt um, the, um, to be sponges which are very basic filter feeding organisms or basic if we think in our sort of very mammalian centric way of looking at evolution. So after kingdom, we've got the next category down, and there are other category, other kingdoms. But let's look at next at phylum, which is the next category down. So the phylum we're actually looking at is chordata, and this is known as the chordate. Um, so you might actually notice something that I haven't gone into quite yet. But I'll talk about it a bit later. But anyway, so, core data. The, a lot of these categories, you'll notice, might actually include a set group of morphological or just general physical characteristics that define that group of organisms. And it's the same if you're looking at plants, if you're looking at bacteria. Some species are generally more diverse than others, and some categories show uh, quite a lot of diversity. But we're looking at, so let's look at core data. Core data is actually defined. Um, these are, I'll just mention two of the characteristics. So it's a notochord. 
and also a pharyngeal split, pharyngeal slit. Some of these characteristics may be lost um, with age, or they might have been lost of evolution, or they might have evolved into other forms. Pharyngeal slits, I believe, generally form, obviously, a lot of the structures in it form the jaws of um, gnathostomes, which are jawed fishes, I think it is. Um, and it will form, it forms the ear bones of um, uh, mammals, I think. Um, but I am not someone that studies fossils, so, or extinct taxa. But core data includes, so we've got lancelets, vertebrates, and sea squirts. There are other phylums in um, the kingdom Animalia, and the closest related to the core dates is the Echinodermata, I think, which is your starfishes. Um, all those things, sea cucumbers, stuff like that. But we're looking at core data. So lancelets and sea squirts, it's actually it's quite debatable what is closer to vertebrates. So vertebrates, we're looking at anything with a backbone. This does actually pose a really big issue. But I have done a video on a hagfish or talked about uh, what defines a fish. So I'll link that above if you're curious. Anyway, so what defines a, um, so the, what makes one closer than the other? Lance looks look very similar to fishes. They have a notochord and they kind of swim a little bit like what you think primitive fishes are. But there's a whole thing in evolution about lost and gained characteristics. And sea squirts, they, they, well, so they generally lose that notochord, that base of similar to vertebrate characteristics of age. There are a number of sea squirts. Um, they used to be known as Eurochord data, I mean sea squirts in general, I can't remember their new name. But there's ones that don't evolve, um, don't lose their um, notochord with age and therefore it's believed that these are most similar to chordates. Um, to vertebrates, sorry. So it's potential that these sort of sessile, they kind of look like that. Um, uh, they're very probably simple, almost cl more closely related than the ones that look um, more similar because these guys have a little larval state, which is a bit more like that's a really dodgy drawing. <laughs> um, they're, they look a lot more, there's a lot more maybe shared characteristics and luckily sea squirts are still around so we can compare them quite well even looking at molecular phylogenetics and comparing to morphological. Um, but next under phylum let's look at class. So there's, in core data there's many different classes but we're going to look at the one that uh, balances your Xanthellus is in, and that's Actino, and I'll rub off this for space, Actino Patirgo. So this is your ray finned fishes, and you might have noticed I've skipped something there, which I'll talk about a bit later anyway. Um, and the other one, the very similar. Um, Class, very closely related, is Sarcopterygo. So Sarcopterygo is your lungfishes, um, your ciliocants, and also your tetrapods. So that is um, mammals, birds, amphibians, and reptiles. So that's where mammals and that lot really fit into um, fishes. And what, but I've done a video on that anyway. So what category next, below class? Below class, we've got order. So this is where we're really getting precise into a very smaller and smaller group of, or smaller and smaller categories of, 
well, organisms. So this is the one that a lot of people get very confused about. So this is the siluriforms. So these are the catfishes. So all your sort of uh, lower carids, uh, lower carplex, they are catfishes. Um, and there are set cat um, morphological features that make uh, all a lot of catfishes share. And one of them is catfishes don't have scales, and plecos don't. And I've done videos about that even. Um, so we're getting smaller, and then we've got below that we've got family. And I'm missing categories that are in between um, because you could go on forever with it all. But then we've got Lower Caridae. So these are commonly known as Plex sucker mouths, but I don't really like calling them sucker mouths or even Plex as my previous video said. But sucker mouths, there's quite a few other siluriforms that have very hill stream. Um, Vast, but adapted for hillstream environments and vast being probably feeding on very similar resource. And then below family, we've got genus. Plural genus is genera, um, which are my. And then that is barren cistrus. And as I said, we're narrowing down a lot. Already in siluriforms, there's quite a few thousand. Lower cards, there's a 1,020 species bearing sisters. I think there's around 10 species. Probably much less, actually. And then the, if we get to species... That's barren sisters xanthellus. So you kind of are narrowing it down. But there are so many categories in between. So if I grab my red pen, because the blue pen's now dropped, um, let's maybe fill in a few more um, sort of small um, classes that fit in between, categories that fit in between. So blue family, we've got subfamily. So for Lord Carrot, um, for Baron Sisters, this is Hypostomine. Oh. Getting smaller as I reach the end of boards. So that's Hypostomine. Then we've got Tribes. I believe um, this is below that. So that's um, Ancestrini, I think. And that's below subfamily. One thing I am not going to go into detail about is the dreaded subspecies. You have also got stuff like uh, super, you might see used between things, or infra, I think, um, where's infra between? The, the, actually no, infra class is below, it would be below class, and actually these guys in the teleostea, teleostei, I think would be how you pronounce and spell it. So you're, this is, it's more simple than you think, and to be honest, when you're talking about species, and especially as a fish keeper, let's ignore that, ignore that, and maybe you probably, just need to keep to that, really. I, to be honest, as a fish keeper, I'd probably maybe even try and focus on that. You don't have to learn them all. This it's impossible to learn them all, um, and generally that's why so many people specialise because you can really focus. So let's talk more about scientific names. Oh, look at. This board is getting absolutely disgusting. Um, so let's write the scientific name. Barry um, Sistrus San. So 
the first thing you might have noticed or you might not have noticed is that the genus is always capitalised, the first letter. And that goes for the same with all the categories above. This um, species name is lowercase. So with that, it's like, it was lowercase anyway. So that's probably the most important thing. Ideally, if you can, italicise it. Um, italicise. I think that's how you spell it. Um, but this really means that when you're typing down a series of words, it means that you can quickly identify what is the scientific name because it's italicised. So people could be like, ah, that's a scientific name. And the rest might be maybe names of other things. Because um, there's so many that in science we do use quite a few different words. So what's another thing that you might use for a scientific name? Generally, whenever you first mention the scientific name, it must be listed as full and it must be cited. So what should I have done? I should have put in um, brackets who wrote it, uh, well, who described this species. So this is rap, uh, is it capitals? No, yes, it is capitals. Daniel. And generally it depends Generally, it depends on your source, but if it's three names, then you'd list all of them. But sometimes if you're doing three names, you just need to do what I'll show you later, Zuran. And D. And then we also want the year, so you in, if you write it, you probably do it in one long group of text. The year was that this was written was uh, 2011. So that would be a full citation or writing of the scientific name. But the, th the good thing is, is that there's loads of different things you can do as well. Um, if, say, it was written by someone like um, Linnaeus, who sort of categorised it or created this binomial system, you just put an uh, L. There are a few other things that you might have to do. Sometimes you might not put the actual name of who wrote it or described it in brackets. Generally, you, uh, from my understanding, you'd only put it in brackets if the uh, species or the name is no longer um, sort of the correct name. Uh, from my understanding. There is a few rules and it's kind of interesting to learn all of them. And what would you do if, like, if you're mentioning name multiple times? Well, if you're naming their name multiple times, then it'd be a bit annoying if you had to write the whole thing. What you can do is you just lob off most of the genus name and you could just do B. Xanthelus. That dot there really means that there's something else to come after it in a way. That it's not just the only thing. So what else is really important about scientific names? They generally all have a type. So this is, well basically this is what more the species are described with, with a set of different um, individuals that are really this description is based on. So the first type is holotype and this is the same for genera actually as well. So holotype, this is the main individual that this um, species is identified on. You will also see the paratype which is like the extra specimens that this is described on and then you also get syntype because if you've seen anything about, um, well, any taxonomy, you'll know it changes a lot. Things do change as we learn more, and this is so important. But this does mean, and I did mention in my Pleco video, this does mean that other previously classified uh, types that have been put in another species, they will become 
those types have become sin types. Sin types are generally, all of these types are individual specimens. They're generally in historical collections and they're generally preserved in alcohols, but it can really vary on the collection and how it was preserved. Generally, you don't want a living specimen because if it dies, it could get damaged. It might not be the most valuable organ uh, one, valuable in how many details you can get off it. And for types of, say, if it's a type of a, a genus, there will be one species that is the type for that genus, so the one that's like the standard. So for Barium cistrus, that would be Barium cistrus. Niviatus. And if you're not familiar, you probably won't have seen this actually in the trade. I don't I usually the most similar one is the L142. So that's going over types. And also you would have to cite that. So that was um don't think I have room on the board really to cite it, but it's um a name I'm gonna really struggle to pronounce, but it was actually described by Cast. Castel, see, we all struggle with spelling. <laughs> nah, boom. And then, uh, 1855. There we go. So, what else is there about scientific names? And you might have seen a few letters mentioned, and sometimes they get mixed up a lot. And this is kind of like how we, if you're using scientific names, how you're communicating your opinions on the different taxa, maybe. So the first one you might have seen is CF. CF means confer to, or generally, um, and uh, it's really often used in ancestrus. CF cirrhosis, which is what many people refer to the common bristlenose. And when people write this, they're basically saying, I think this is ancestral cirrhosis, but I'm not entirely sure. So the next one is AF. So this example, I use parencistrus. Oh, that was a really weird pick. AF of Antiochus. So this is the one that doesn't really turn gold at all. Um, and it's actually very different morphologically. But this AF means affinity to. So this is basically saying this fish looks like that. Well, this fish looks like Ancestrus of Antiochus. But it's not. But it's very similar to. So it's got affinity to, but we know it's not. These are very similar, and you can. It, they are kind of used a bit interchangeably. But what other shorthand is there? The most useful is this one, SP. Or it'd be more correct to say SP. It really ignore, annoys when people put caps where it's not needed. Um, but there's, for example. What would be a good one with SP? Let's just do an cistrus. So this is generally used, this SP, this is actually means species. Uh, so generally it's used when you don't know the species or it's not described, which means you don't really know species generally. So as I said, we know it's in this genus and cistrus, but I'm not entirely sure what ancestral species it is, or maybe it isn't one, and we know it isn't one, um, that's been described yet. You might also see it also used with um, tribes and subfamilies, um, ancestrini. Oh my god, I think I've spelt that really badly wrong. Um, but you might use it with uh, tribes, so ancestrini, um, SP, so we say, we know it's in this tribe, but we're not entirely sure what species or even what genus it is. 
and therefore maybe it's a new genus or maybe it fits into another but we're not quite sure yet with what we know at the moment or what we've studied at the moment. SP actually has a plural so that is SPP so you're describing here multiple species so generally it's used or I use it when I'm saying um, let's do it here so I use it when say I'm just saying species in ancestrous like plural species in ancestrous so multiple species in ancestrous um, there is no plural or singular for ancestrous and that's the same for all genera um, as in the word there is no that is a common name that is not a real word the actual word is Choidorus that is the plural that is the singular and people just like to lob letters off things like you get Choidora then you get Corridor or oh, Corrie it's just lobbing letters off things just for the sake of it it doesn't take an extra five seconds to do an extra few letters. Um, so what other things might you see though? So we've also got N, that might mean new species. So you might see it, um, so when Baron sisters, oh. entirely sure why it's between um, the genus and the species but I assume it's like saying it's a new species why am I rubbing off um, but you'll see there it's saying this is Baron Sister Sandellus it's a new species when it's defined as not a new species I don't know but generally you'll see it in the original description so it's just defining that these are in this paper these are ones that have been described before and these are the new ones in our paper um, that's why I assume it's more or less saying. Um, other ones you'll see S, Y, N. This means synotype. Synotypes are um, or synonymized. So this, you might use it when you're saying that. So I use it hypostomous. And then I might say syn cotchidon. So, Hypostomus being a genus, Cochidon was also a genus, but Cochidon was actually proven to be within Hypostomus for now. Um, so, it is a, so it is synonymous with Hypostomus. So, that's where I use that when I'm referring to, say, um, species like Sonne, uh, Cochidon, I think Basilisca, I think Chimera is also in that category. Um, so it's all sorts of like communication, you like with common names you've got none of this. So a lot of people really struggle with common names, um, scientific names, and I think part of the reason is that no one really talks about etymology, and I think etymology is really what catches people's interest. So scientific names aren't actually that, um, well that distinct really from English but English uses so many different rules you've got um, obviously you've got the Latin you've got the Greek you've got um, random words from everywhere you've got Norse you've got Celtic you've got French and you're using rules from everywhere so I don't know why people are complaining about scientific names really when it's not like you need it all the time to talk in a way if you get what I mean but you only need to learn a set group for your what you're interested in, in the way, if you get what I mean. But my favourite when it comes to this, and this is what I used to tell my students, say to no person, uh, let's go with oh no, these are really you species name is lowercase, just it looks a bit higher case, but it's very wonky, but oh well. So you see it's in the Persia, the Upari, and you do get longer scientific names, and I'll go over another one later, but it does help to really 
split these words up. So Satan meaning demon, spirit, person meaning perch, you pari meaning um, demon. And if you split it up, you've got Satan, O Persa, you pari. It kind of makes it easy if you split it up, and especially for remembering spellings if you split it up. And no one minds if you make spelling mistakes. And you can do it as you learn, you can Google words and stuff like that. So let's go on to something a bit more complicated. And this one I never thought I'd done, but I did. So this is. And let's do one of the longer ones. Let's go with Josie. So my autocorrect to my phone does actually know half of these for some reason. But some of these words are really long. So I actually split it up and actually kind of remember, because I don't know their etymology, I don't know what these words actually mean. But I kind of split it up. So Tirio, Tirigo. So it goes Tirio, because that's like a pterosaur, which is a dinosaur. And then let's go, I don't, I just went to the O, click. So maybe, and then, or you could actually, it's probably easier, rather than splitting up the click, maybe doing click. Ick these meaning fish, I know that. Re so really splitting up these words where it's kind of that little bit easier for you really does make the entire world of difference. And I've left my rubber right up there. Um, so camera shut off. Um, but yeah, so just splitting them makes it a lot easier. And a lot of people, one of the big things I think people say is I don't know Latin, I can't know Latin, I don't do Latin, whatever. Firstly, English uses a lot of Latin. And what they mean by Latin is Latinicized. That would be a reasonable way to spell it. Probably not. Um, but by Latinized, it actually means using the Latin alphabet, which is A, B, C. Because some scientific names are in like Chinese, Japanese, um, so they have to use the same alphabet. Imagine if they did like a lot of dinosaurs, as I said in I think the previous video, a lot of dinosaurs like theropod dinosaurs described in China, where a lot of them are very well fossilized, very well preserved. They got given a lot of Chinese um, names. So if they were written in Chinese uh, characters, that would sort of reduce the universal nature of scientific names. Another thing that scientific names are is they can, they're generally gendered. So this isn't really a familiar concept when it comes to English. We generally don't have gendered words. We have his, her, him, she, it, maybe. So you have like uh, pronouns that are gendered. Um, miss, uh, Mr lady, um, lord, stuff like that anyway. But in other languages, so French, Spanish, there is that sort of gendering of words and scientific names do have genders. And I don't think, it's not something you ever need to really worry about, um, but you, the, the ending of the name might change depending on the gender. They can be feminine. And it's regardless whether the fit individual or the individual like individual fish is male or female is that species is like um kind of listed as masculine or feminine so you got masculine and then you got the ones in between that are neither just neutral it's just an interesting thing because i tried to find out what the rules were and is a little bit more flexible than people might think, especially when it comes to that. Um, and Latinize, because it's like, how do I Latinize this? Um, but how are scientific names produced? So this I'll only go over quickly. So, are they produced? So they need to be in a scientific journal or paper. 
scientific paper. And these will be peer reviewed. They need to follow the ICC Eden's rules. And I think that's how I put it very basic, but especially these rules and the peer reviewing make the scientific names very universal. It's not like common names where it depends where you live in the time. These are sort of, and there's reviews, so I think So that's where you kind of get with the review papers and the scientific papers is where they're kind of in agreement. You have to base it on a series of morphological, maybe genetic uh, markers that define the different species um, or genus or family. So it's not like a common name where you can make it up and it could be anything because common names in effect are made up names with no rules. And you can name something anything you want and it's a common name. Scientific names, as I showed you, also give lineage. You know its closest relatives. Um, and I think that's where I'm going to end it anyway. Because cause really, it's just having the confidence really to try and push yourself to learn. And it really improves your fish keeping. It's probably one of the most vital things, especially if you want to keep catfishes or anything... Well, fresh water in general, where there's so many undescribed species or ones without common names, or where, without using a scientific name, you can not do any research. So it is really important to learn these scientific names, or just put some effort in. And there's no reason not to give them a go, really. So anyway, thank you for watching, and um, I'll do another video soon.